Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page International. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer is now suggesting that Joe Biden may have been compromised and involved in organized crime after more evidence indicates that the Biden family received more than $40 million after six separate actions were taken, four of which happened while Biden was already acting as president. Joe Rogan is supporting President Trump's assertion that it's better not to take sides between Russia and Ukraine. Rather, it's better to just bring an end to the bloodshed and death. Besides the CCP setting up police stations on American soil, the Attorney General of Missouri is investigating so-called CCP service stations that are now popping up. So, were Prigozhin's original plans leaked to the Russian army as according to Western officials? Was the original plan to capture top military brass before changing to a march toward Moscow? The EU is taking steps to create a digital euro that will be much like cash where customers can pay stores directly from a digital wallet. This would avoid a bank being the middleman collecting a fee in between. And a child trafficker was caught in broad daylight trying to transport an infant from Ukraine for the purposes of being sold for his organs. Okay, let's get into it. On Wednesday, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer suggested that the Biden family may have accepted in excess of $40 million from foreign nationals in exchange for favorable policy decisions. Comer said that now the House Oversight Committee has identified six specific policy decisions where Biden took actions that indicate that he may have been compromised. Comer also noted that out of those six policy decisions, four of them were made while Joe Biden was president early on, where we cannot come to any other conclusion as to why these decisions were made other than the fact that this president is compromised. Comer alleged that this was organized crime. There's no other way to define it. The Oversight Committee chairman explained that as recently as in the last five days, his panel has obtained banking statements and suspicious activity reports that show more bank accounts, more shell companies, and more Bidens. In other words, these reports show that the Bidens are being involved in the family's overseas influence peddling scheme. Comer said that we're going to try to determine how much money the Bidens took and what role Joe Biden played in all of this. It's a huge puzzle. He added around 30 to 40 different banks and about that many different shell companies are involved. This is an organized attempt by the Biden family to hide the source of money going into these shell companies and to distract from the IRS so they wouldn't have to pay taxes on it. And that's exactly what the IRS whistleblowers alleged in the transcribed interview with the Ways and Means Committee, that the Biden family never paid money on any of these wires that came into these shell companies. Comer claimed that now he's confident his investigation not only will prove that the Biden family raked in at least $17 million from overseas, but that the transactions could exceed $40 million plus. So far, Comer has identified at least nine members of the Biden family who are involved. This includes James Biden, Hunter Biden, Sarah Biden, Haley Biden, Melissa Cohen Biden, and Hunter's ex-wife, Kathleen Buell. They have all allegedly received large foreign payments. Podcast host Joe Rogan and stand-up comedian Duncan Trussell criticized Democrats for giving up anti-war beliefs. They also praised President Trump for calling for peace in Ukraine. On a recent episode of his podcast, Joe Rogan spoke about how the anti-war left of his youth has largely disappeared. Rogan also condemned the rah-rah aspect of some politicians' political statements about the Russian-Ukraine war. While Rogan described those statements as a very complex issue, Trussell joked that they are like a pep rally for murdering people. Rogan also complained that establishment Democrats and Republicans appear united to prolong the Ukraine war. But they're all united on this idea that they should continue. There's no one, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, like the Democrats are always anti-war, always. Oh yeah. Always. Oh yeah. This is the first time where the Democrats are like wholesale buying the narrative and we have to stop Putin. We have to support Ukraine. I mean, how many 
Democrat peaceful people that used to have syringes in their Twitter bio now have a Ukraine flag. When President Trump was asked at the CNN town hall whether he wanted Ukraine or Russia to win the war, he answered, I want everybody to stop dying. They're dying, Russians and Ukrainians. I want them to stop dying. And I'll have that done. I'll have that done in 24 hours. I'll have it done. You need the power of the presidency to do. So Rogan described President Trump's answer as perfect. And he mocked CNN for trying to make a gotcha moment out of a subject that literally has the fate of the world in front of it. Rogan also noted the possibility of nuclear war because people are flippantly supporting this continued conflict with no talk at all about some sort of a compromise. Meanwhile, Trussell expressed his shock that President Trump's statement was seen as so controversial. Trussell said any attempt at stopping a war without World War III or violence or whatever, it's glorious. Trussell also argued by saying, even if it fails long term, you're going to look great if you were a peacemaker in the world. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey is going to investigate a so-called service center in his state that is operated by a Chinese Communist Party intelligence service. The United Front Work Department is a CCP intelligence service that specializes in coordinating foreign and domestic influence operations. It operates overseas Chinese service centers in at least seven U.S. cities. The seven overseas Chinese service center branches that were launched between 2014 and 2017 are located in California, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Carolina, Texas, and Utah. On Wednesday, Bailey sent a letter to Missouri Republican Representative Ann Wagner to inform her that his office would immediately investigate this matter. Bailey wrote that the information you have shared with my office about a possible CCP outpost within the borders of Missouri is deeply concerning and will receive the full attention of my office. The threat posed by the CCP is very real. Last week, Wagner notified Bailey about the Overseas Chinese Service Center branch in Missouri. In addition to Wagner, several other Republican lawmakers raised concerns about these service centers. This includes Senator John Cornyn of Texas, Senators Deb Fisher and Pete Rickett of Nebraska, along with Nebraska Republican Representative Don Bacon. There's no evidence yet of these service centers of the Chinese Ministry of Public Security committing a crime. But it is clear that overseas Chinese service center branches support China's global policing efforts by serving as overseas Chinese police contact points and conducting armed patrols. Mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin took the world by surprise with his sudden mutiny last weekend. But in fact, this was not part of Prigozhin's original plan. Apparently, his original plan was to capture Defense Minister Sergei Shiloh and General Gerasimov, who is the chief of Russia's general staff. Apparently, he was planning to capture them when they were scheduled to visit the southern region bordering Ukraine. But according to Western officials, the plan was discovered by the Russian Federal Security Service, or the FSB, two days before it was to be carried out. General Viktor Zolotov, the commander of the National Guard of Russia, which is a domestic military force that reports directly to President Putin, confirmed that authorities knew about Prigozhin's intentions before he launched his attempt. Zolotov told state media on Tuesday that specific leaks about preparations for a rebellion that would begin between June 22nd and June 25th were leaked from Prigozhin's camp. Western intelligence agencies also discovered the plans of Prigozhin ahead of time by analyzing intercepted electronic communications and satellite images. The preparations included amassing large amounts of ammunition, fuel and hardware. This included tanks, armored vehicles, and sophisticated mobile air defense days before the attack. Interestingly, Western officials thought that Prigozhin's initial plan had a better chance of success, but the plan was eventually leaked. This forced Prigozhin to develop an alternative plan. He decided on an early mutiny and the seizure of the southern Russian city of Rostovodon. Western intelligence suggests that Prigozhin dared to take this action because he believed that some of the Russian armed forces would join the rebellion and oppose their commanders. However, 
Wagner's forces encountered few obstacles on their way to Moscow, and there's no evidence that any regular troops turned to join them. American officials believe that the lack of regular troops joining them forced Prigozhin to halt his advance on the Russian capital. It's widely believed, including by the U.S. intelligence community, that General Sergei Sorovikin, the commander of the Russian Aerospace Forces, had advanced knowledge of the planned insurgents by Prigozhin. It has not been possible to determine whether Sorovikin passed this information on to the FSB or how the agency discovered Prigozhin's plans. In Washington, U.S. officials said that it appears that Sorovikin might have been sympathetic to Prigozhin's aims of holding the military top brass responsible for missteps in the special operation in Ukraine, but he may not have been supportive of any mutiny. The recent whereabouts of the Russian general Sergei Sorovikin and Valery Grasimov are not confirmed. They have not been seen in public since the Wagner mercenaries aborted the short-lived rebellion. Sorovikin is a respected general who was involved in the construction of Russia's frontline defenses after last year's counteroffensive in Ukraine. He was replaced as top commander in January of this year. U.S. officials have also said that there are indications that other Russian generals may have also supported Prigozhin's plans to change the personnel of the defense ministry leadership by force. If General Sorovikin was involved in the events of last weekend, it would be the latest sign of infighting within the Russian military leadership since the start of Putin's special operation in Ukraine. But General Sorovikin was the first senior commander to denounce the plot last Friday. He urged Prigozhin to get his men to stop. Forces under Sorovikin's command carried out an airstrike against the Wagner group. This was the only such attack on the insurgents by regular Russian forces. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov dismissed the report of Sorovikin that was published by the New York Times as speculation and gossip at a press conference on Wednesday. Before we move on, I want to take a moment to thank you all for your support of Front Page. Every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you are still subscribed because some of our audience members have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. Okay, let's get back into it. On Wednesday, the European Union took its first steps towards launching a digital version of the euro. This is a controversial project that has been questioned by politicians and banks. Over 100 central banks around the world are exploring or preparing to implement digital currencies in response to the rapid growth in electronic payments. Digitalization and collateralization of the single currency was first proposed by Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank in 2020. This was accompanied by a public consultation that was conducted by the Frankfurt-based institution. On Wednesday, a proposal was published by the European Commission. The European Commission is the EU's executive arm. This will serve as a legal basis for the European Central Bank to launch a digital euro. It would be available to residents of the eurozone and to visitors. Surprisingly, by using digital wallets for online and offline payments, citizens would be able to maintain the same level of anonymity as coins and banknotes. Payments would not go through a bank. However, this move is at the proposal level and a final law must be endorsed by the European Parliament and the 27 member states of the EU. Supporters believe that this will complement cash and it will prevent the European Central Banks from leaving a gap between the flow of funds from customer to stores where banks and other central banks outside the EU could collect a fee. The Commission Vice President Valdis Dombrovsky announced that given that the euro is already the world's second most traded currency, it is not an area where we can afford to stay behind the curve. We need to move ahead with a digital currency. Of course, there are those who support it and there are also those who criticize it. German MEP Marcus Ferber said that the European Central Bank and the Commission have yet to make a compelling case of why we need the digital euro and what added value it will deliver. A man who was pretending to be a charity worker who was actually an evil child trader 
has been caught red-handed while trying to sell an 11-month-old baby for organ transplants, but he has been detained in Ukraine. The man had allegedly given a $1,000 down payment to the boy's mother. He claimed that he would ensure that the boy was adopted in the EU to live in safety away from the war. He offered the mother a total of $5,000 for the baby, but he intended to sell the child to traffickers for $25,000. As he attempted to cross the Ukraine-Slovakian border with the child, the man was captured with a female accompanying him. The good news is that this boy was saved. But it's likely that the man had previously sold three other children for purposes of taking them out of Ukraine. According to a Ukrainian journalist, Vitaly Galgola, the detained man had been looking for parents who were ready to sell their child for organs. Galgola said law enforcement officers have operational information that this was not for adoption to the EU and the child was to have been sold to illegal organ transplanters. While the rescued child was reunited with his mother, the man was remanded in custody for further investigation. According to a police spokesperson, the man is being held under child trafficking laws and he could face up to 15 years in prison if convicted. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. We've also heard from many of our viewers that they don't get notifications of our videos anymore from YouTube. So please follow us on Telegram, Gab, Getter, True Social, Twitter, and on Ganjing World for the latest updates. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.